total is seven. So got it. OK, we'll go ahead and get started then. Um, hope others will join us. All right, good afternoon. This is Transportation Committee Chair Deb Barber. It is Monday, February 14, 2022. Before I call the meeting to order, I'd like to say a few things about how we will conduct this meeting. I want to acknowledge that COVID-19 is causing us to alter our usual procedures. Due to the ongoing pandemic, Council Chair Zelle has determined that it's not reasonable or prudent to conduct in-person meetings at this time. Accordingly, Met Council members will participate in this meeting by phone or other electronic means, and this Transportation Committee meeting will be conducted under Minnesota Statute Section 13D.021. Because we are conducting the meeting electronically, all votes must be taken by roll call. Before we take or start the meeting, we need to establish whether there is a quorum. With that, Jenna, can you call the roll, please? Barbara. Here. Chambliss. Cummings. Here. Fredson. Here. Gonzalez. Here. Sterner. And Zirin. All right, having a quorum present, I call to order a meeting of the Metropolitan Council Transportation Committee for February 14, 2022. Our first order of business is approval of the agenda. If there are no changes or additions, we can move ahead to approval of the minutes. All right, we'll move to approval of the minutes for the January 24th, 2022 meeting. Did anyone have any changes or additions? Hearing none, I'd entertain a motion to approve the minutes from the January 24th, 2022 meeting. Cummings moves approval. It's moved by Cummings. Is there a second? Fredson will second. Seconded by Fredson. Is there any other discussion? All right, seeing and hearing none. Jenna, can you call the roll, please? Chambliss. Cummings. Aye. Fredson. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Sterner. Zirin. And Barber. Aye. And with that, the minutes are approved. Um, I believe we have, we're going to have some people here to, um, uh, from the public to address the committee, but I'm not sure that I'm seeing them. Um, Greg or Jenna, could you advise me if they're on the call? Yeah, I don't see, I don't see them and nor have I received an email. All right, if if they do um, pop on later, we will um, uh, uh, give them the opportunity to speak in case anyone's having connection issues or something like that. Um, but we'll move ahead with our reports in the meantime. Um, our first report is our TAC report and we have David Fenley here. Good afternoon, everyone. My video is on. Great to see you all, Chair Barber, Council members. Great to be here yet again. Um, David Fenley, Chair of the Transportation Accessibility Advisory Committee. Uh, quick update on our meeting um, um, from February. And then just one little extra piece of information about what we are working on. Um, I'll start with uh, the priority seating work group that's been going on for almost a year now. We have a video, it's posted. I'm sure you all have seen it. I've talked about it before, um, but we're satisfied with it. Um, they, that work group will, will be putting together a few more materials um, as well. Um, and one, one fun result of this, this project was um, uh, the fact that now that, this, now that the light rail seats are not uh, fabric, we can stick uh, priority seating stickers right onto the seats that are for uh, folks who are aging and folks who have disabilities. So that was one fun outcome from, from the work group. Um, another thing that came out of the work group too, uh, 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 according to uh, many of the TAC members and also um, some Metro Transit staff, this was actually some of the closest work that TAC members and Metro Transit staff have done together. Um, so uh, some of the some of the project managers and myself deemed it necessary to formalize uh, the process with which um, TAC interacts with Metro Transit staff to make sure that communication is smooth um, and that everybody is included. So that was another fun outcome of that. That is one of the, this is one of the things that I really, um, um, wanted to, to, to move forward uh, with, uh, while I have been chair of TAC was to have, have more, have a better relationship, more working relationship between TAC members and staff, but, but that needs to be formalized. So communication um, goes smoothly. We had an update from council member Chambliss on the police work group. Uh, we had some suggestions for them and otherwise it was, it was good. And then finally we, um, we met with Selena Martina, who uh, 
who is the senior manager of equity inclusion over there at the Metropolitan Council. I think there's some overlap and uh, we'll be able to learn from her and also hopefully um, inform some of her work. Uh, but that is all I have for today and I'm happy to answer any questions if you have them. Okay, good, thank you, David. Are there questions from council members? I don't have any questions, but again, I really appreciate these updates. I, I really do, and I'm glad to hear that the communication path is, I know that was a big objective that you had coming into this um, into this role, um, that we're really getting some of those good dialogues going, because I think it just helps us overall as an organization. So thank you so much for your time and coming to report to us. We really do appreciate it. My pleasure, Chair, and, and I do have to to commend Metro Transit Metropolitan Council staff for willingness to work closely with us too. Um, and it's not something that you have to do. It's something that that uh, you choose to do. Um, I think everybody's better off because of it, but but they, they deserve a, a thank you as well. All right, thank you so much, David. Uh, now I'll move on to our other reports. We have MTS Director Carlson. Thank you, Madam Chair. A um, few items to report on tonight. The 2022 regional solicitation for about $180 million of federal funds is getting ready to open. I've shared before that overviews of the process have been underway. Before your next meeting, we should have the application system actually open to receive applications and an announcement will be released when that occurs. Applications are due April 14th uh, with scoring across the summer and decisions on project selection late this year. On the finance side, motor vehicle sales tax receipts for January 2022 were flat with last January at 26 million um, uh, received by the council, uh, 26 million. So actual receipts were uh, about 9% below forecast. Uh, so this actually contrasts with all sources in the state where last week it was reported uh, tax collections were 25% higher than expected, led by corporate tax receipts. So while no single month is a good performance indicator, uh, we'll be watching closely for the February forecast update and the overall trend on MVEST. And then in our contracted services, I've reported before that we're amending our service contracts to improve hourly wages for drivers to a minimum pay of $20. For the most part, these are now executed and providers have reported that the increased pay has actually resulted in increased applications. Uh, some contractors are even reaching out to former operators to see if they're interested to return at higher pay. Uh, meanwhile, the COVID case count continues to drop and uh, very significantly, and we've seen service quality improve as operator availability has been restored. So we're very happy with that. Uh, and then finally, uh, you may have seen news reports of a bus, a bus fire uh, affecting a bus in our regional fleet. So last Friday, a coach bus at the Southwest Transit Garage caught fire. Uh, the cause of the fire is under investigation. And uh, unfortunately, I need to clarify, this is a different bus than the Metro Mobility bus that caught fire after, after an accident on February 4th. Uh, so the Southwest uh, bus was a 45 foot coach bus. Uh, reminder for this group that the council owns the regional fleet, including the Suburban Transit Association providers bus fleet. Uh, that vehicle appears to be a complete loss and other vehicles in the garage uh, will need cleaning due to, due to smoke from the fire. Extent of damage remains underway and MTS fleet management staff are working with Southwest Transit staff uh, on, on this item. Fire suppression systems in the garage help contain the fire along with emergency response from Eden Prairie. Uh, and unfortunately, four firefighters were injured in, from smoke inhalation, according to media reports. Uh, three treated unseen and one transported for some additional uh, treatment for smoke inhalation. So wishing a quick re recovery to the responders. And that concludes my report, Madam Chair. Thank you, Charles. Are there questions for Director Carlson? I have a quick question. So, and you may have answered this and I miss it. Um, so when some uh, something like this happens with um, a bus in the suburban transit provider fleet, um, do we take responsibility for the investigation or do they take primary, primary responsibility for the investigation? Yeah, so we, we work with them. Um, you know, I think it's really a combination, uh, Madam Chair, between the opt-out provider, the suburban transit association provider, the local, Jurist, you know, emergency response jurisdiction, and then uh, working with us on 
insurance and other other factors that come into uh, you know kind of making the council's investment whole. Thank you. All right. Uh, additional uh, council member Fredson. Thanks, Chair uh, and Director. I'm curious to know on the invest collections if if we know if we're able to trace whether or not it's connected to supply chain issues. You know, I know that new vehicles and even used vehicles have been tough to um, uh, for dealers to sort of stock up on and, and sell. So, do we know if it's that, or or is there not a way to to, to gauge that? Yeah, good good question, uh, Madam Chair, Council Member Fredson. Uh, the data we have are really about tax receipts as opposed to the the factors going into it. Anecdotally, we do know that uh, prices are up and supply is down, uh, but um, the specifics from there are are something we're continuing to track. We know that if people could, they would buy more vehicles than they currently are, uh, but it is impacted by supply chain. Sounds like Wes may yeah, have further Wes. insights. Yeah, Madam Chair and, and members, uh, I would also mention that we do monthly projections of MVEST, which are based upon historic patterns of, of the fluctuations of car purchases over the over a year. They're not, they're, it's in some sense, it, it gives you a pattern, but you can't rely on one month's data to, to know whether there's a real problem that exists because the monthly purchasing behavior does fluctuate uh, significantly. So I'm not suggesting that there isn't a downward trend in car purchases, but I'm suggesting that one month's data um, is difficult to make to discern from. Councilmember Fredson. Thank you. And, and just a quick follow up and, you know, preaching to the choir here, but I just think this is another good example of the need for us to find a reliable funding source that actually um, goes up, uh, you, know, you know, over time um, as opposed to the uh, motor vehicle sales tax. So thank you. Okay. Additional questions or comments? Um, I'll finish this with one just little comment. So big thank you to the first responders um, out in Eden Prairie and sending well wishes to to all of them. And also a big thank you to the Metro Mobility driver who's quick at thinking and action on that particular day. Um, um, saved probably not only themselves, but their passengers. So very, very important to recognize these things that we really have to be thankful for the people who can respond in moments when the rest of us um, can't. So much appreciation to all. Um, so now we'll turn over to um, uh, Metro Transit General Manager Hoistra for his report. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. I'm going to begin with the COVID update. Uh, as we uh, we ended up with more than 300 reported COVID cases in January, that is by far the the most cases we've ever had in a single month. But so far in February, when we're at mid-February, we've recorded only 15 cases. So this is really just about. 10% uh, of the case rate we were seeing in January. So our cases, of course, are following the patterns we're seeing statewide and locally, as, a, as I always report that they do, but it's pretty remarkable uh, downward spike uh, that we're seeing at this time. Um, at this point, the operational impacts we experienced during the, during the Omicron spike have uh, largely been resolved. Uh, we're not seeing many missed uh, trips uh, or late trips uh, like we were seeing uh, in the, in mid-January when, when Omicron was, was spiking at that time. Turning to an update on our operator staffing, uh, we're about 33 operators below our ideal levels of full-time and part-time weekly operators. We continue to promote our openings. This includes hiring events. Uh, we had about a dozen uh, candidates who attended our event on Saturday with five candidates passing the interview process, none with current CDLs. Uh, so we're we're struggling a little bit uh, in keeping up with attrition, which runs about 12 operators per month. So we still have uh, strong concerns about our ability to to hire operators. Uh, our next event is scheduled for Wednesday from 4 to 7 p.m. at our instruction center. Um, finally, I'll mention that we officially submitted the zero emissions bus transition plan to the state legislature on Friday, following the council's adoption last Wednesday. Thank you for that. And the plan is available on our website, so we are raising awareness about it. We are also raising awareness about it via social media. Uh, I want to once again recognize the staff involved in that work, Carrie and 
and Matt Dake's leadership has been wonderful and all the staff that worked around around their leadership has been it's really created a good product uh, uh, that we can report to the legislature if you're getting questions about the plan do let us know if you need information to respond to those questions we'd be happy to provide that so thank you madam chair Thank you. Are there any questions for General Manager Koistra? All right, thank you, Wes. Um, next, we're on to our consent items. There is only one item on consent. Um, there is no uh, presentation, but um, we're um, just going to move the item um, as it is because there's just the one thing. So I would um, entertain a motion to approve the item on consent, which is business item 2022-37. So move. Moved by Council Member Gonzalez. Is there a second? That's a second. Seconded by Fredson. Is there any other discussion? Seeing and hearing none, Jenna, could you call the roll, please? Chambliss? Cummings? Aye. Fredson? Aye. Gonzalez? Aye. Sterner, Zirin, and Barber. Aye. With that, the motion passes. Next, we're on to business item 2022-38, which is the Metro Purple Line Bus Rapid Transit Engineering and Project Management Services contract. And I believe we have Craig Lamont, Lamont here to present. Yes. Uh, good oh, afternoon. Hi, welcome. Uh, Madam Chair and committee members, uh, Craig Lamoth, uh, Purple Line Project Manager. I've also got uh, our procurement director, Jody Jacoby, here with me tonight. Um, she and I will be co-presenting this item. Uh, tonight, we're seeking your recommendation to move forward with contract award for engineering and project management services for the Purple Line. So this, a little bit about the scope of work for this contract. This is the largest anticipated professional and technical services contract for the project. Uh, a major engineering focus will be on completing design over the course of the next two years. So hopefully by the end of 2023, we are concluding design of Purple Line. And then the major initial project management focus uh, for this consultant team is going to be the project's first major submittal to the Federal Transit Administration, seeking um, the Federal Transit Administration's rating of project merit. Um, that'll be published in spring of 2023 in an annual report to Congress. Uh, that submittal is due to FTA in the late summer time frame. Next slide, please. So Ramsey County has led this environmental analysis phase that just concluded with the Federal Transit Administration entering the project into the Capital Investment Grant Program as a new starts project on December 9th of 2021. Um, both the Federal Transit Administration and the Federal Highway Administration both issued their environmental decisions on the project also in late 2021. So we are now officially in the project development phase. Uh, so with a little luck, a lot of hard work and close collaboration with our project partners, we would expect to be readying for revenue service in about four and a half years time. So at this time, I'm going to turn over the mic to Jody to cover the next couple of slides about the procurement process we went through. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and committee members. My name is Jody Jacoby and I'm the procurement director and I'm going to talk the next few slides just about the procurement process. So a really high level overview. October 12th, the request for proposal, the RFP was issued and this was a federally funded project as a result a DBE or a disadvantaged business enterprise goal was assigned and there was a 22% goal assigned. The project was advertised for 47 days and there were a, a total of 23 registered plan holders who downloaded the documents. And these plan holders included 20 different architectural and engineering consulting firms, one firm that identified as a subcontractor, and then two, two plan rooms, procurement, facilitated a pre-proposal meeting on October 20th and there were 13 different consulting firms or vendors that attended. Some information that was shared at that pre-proposal meeting including specifics on the solicitation requirements, 
DBE submittal requirements, and then they discussed some project specification and answered some specific questions that vendors asked. Proposals were due on November 29th, and at that time, a single proposal from Kim Lee Horn was received. Next slide, please. The standard procurement process when we receive a single bid or proposal is to, to stop and have an adequate competition analysis that's conducted by a different procurement agent who had no involvement with this process. And one of the things that they do is they contact all of the plan holders who did not submit a proposal and ask them why they didn't to find out if there was anything that may have been restricted or limited competition. And what we found out is that it's pretty obvious there's a lot of public projects happening right now. In this project, there was a lot of different specialties. And so um, some of the firms teamed up to submit a proposal. At the end of the adequate competition analysis, it was determined that there was nothing in the specifications that was restrictive, either with the specifications or the scope of work. So then procurement facilitated an evaluation panel review, and it included internal staff from the council and many of our stakeholders, including MnDOT, the city of St. Paul, um, Ramsey County, City of Adonis Heights and City of White Bear Lake. At the conclusion of the negotiations, a best and final offer was negotiated with Kim Lee Horn, and they were able to negotiate a, a much lower price. And today the recommendation is in front of you to proceed with that award to Kim Lee Horn based on the most advantageous proposal submitted to the council for this project. And I'll turn it back over to Craig. Thank you, Jody. Um, wanted to take a little bit of time on this next slide to talk a little bit about the project and the, the support for the project. Uh, this project really dates back to uh, the late 1990s. That was really the first step in the planning process. Uh, and as the previous name for this project, the Rush Line, indicates uh, at what point in time this project was looking to be a project that was likely uh, heavy passenger rail uh, operating on freight rail tracks uh, serving all the way up to Rush City, uh, well north of the Twin Cities. And as a result of the planning that has gone on uh, for the last 20 years on this project, uh, things have evolved, but all along the way there's been a lot of public process. Uh, most recently, Ramsey County had initiated uh, the pre-project development uh, phase, which was indicated in that schedule slide earlier in the slide deck. They initiated that in 2014. Uh, that phase really concluded with the selection and recommendation of the locally preferred alternative, which was BRT uh, between downtown St. Paul and downtown White Bear Lake. Uh, and that selection recommendation was made in May of 2017 by the Policy Advisory Committee for the Rush Line Project. Uh, which consisted of policymakers primarily uh, representing all the uh, corridor communities uh, between St. Paul and White Bear Lake. Uh, and then between 2018 and 2021, uh, Ramsey County advanced the project design to greater than 15% complete, sought project partner support for those preliminary design plans, and then also under the direction of the Federal Transit Administration, Ramsey County also completed the environmental assessment, which is essentially the environmental review document for the project. Uh, they published that document to the public for review and comment in May of 2021. Uh, but not unlike most transitway projects, uh, the Purple Line has not had unanimous support. Uh, for example, there has been a mix of opinions on the White Bear Lake City Council dating back at least to their resolution of support for the locally preferred alternative, which was a split vote. And then more recently in late November, a pause the project resolution was introduced by a White Bear Lake uh, City Council member. Uh, that resolution failed to pass. Um, but this contract um, is flexible enough to adapt to any future changes, both in the federal program requirements, uh, as well as in any local policy direction. Next slide, please. 
So the recommended action before you tonight is seeking your recommendation to the council to authorize the regional administrator to negotiate and execute contract 21 P242 with Kimley Horn and Associates to provide design, engineering, and project management services for the Metro Purple Line bus rapid transit project in an amount not to exceed $34,998,088. Next slide, please. Uh, with that, I'd be happy to stand for questions. Um, I also want to note here, since the last time I was before this body in the fall, uh, we've since activated a project website for the project, which can be found at the link on this slide. And as always, I can always be reached at any time uh, via email. Very good. Thank you, Craig. Thank you, Jody. Um, are there questions from council members? Council Member Gonzalez. Uh, thank you very much. <clears throat> Not a specific, well, yeah, kind of a specific question, actually. Um, in view of the the information that, that we receive about the opposition at the local level, at least by some elected officials, uh, the fact that um, we only had a one uh, bid uh, and all within the context of the the issues that we had on the southwest line um i i would just like to to ask all the the technical folks to be extra careful and to review the details as much as possible on this particular project which i understand it's not as complex as as the um, so what's one, but still the 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 amount of um, review and skepticism is going to be there. Um, so uh, just a cautionary note to make sure that we double cross all the the T's and double dot all the I's in this particular project as we move forward. And one last thing is that if there's there are any lessons that we can learn from the recent projects as far as uh, on the engineering side, on the design side, and um, on how to communicate with stakeholders and folks that might be affected by the construction. Now, please, we implement those from the beginning, and, and hopefully we can have a smoother process this time. So thank you. Uh, thank you, um, Madam Chair, uh, Council Member Gonzalez. Those are all great points. Um, the project team is definitely taking those points into consideration. Um, for example, uh, we are in the process right now of hiring up community outreach staff to make sure that we have enough of those resources in house. Uh, and additionally, this contract will bring support in many areas, including community outreach and communications, uh, recognizing the importance of the, uh, the transparency uh, and working with our project partners, as well as the, the public in general uh, within those communities. Uh, we're also coordinating uh, on a regular basis with the other projects, in particular uh, Gold Line. And uh, we're benefiting hugely from Purple Line. Gold Line is a very similarly scoped project, but it's two, out, two years out ahead of Purple Line. So uh, we're definitely taking the advantage of lessons learned, uh, any bumps in the road that Gold Line may have hit uh, to avoid those bumps, and, and then just best practices. Thank you. Council Member Fredson. Question for Mr. Lamoth, and uh, don't mean to put you on the spot here. You did uh, highlight that the a previous city council vote in White Bear Lake was divided. Does that mean that that all of those other cities had unanimous um, endorsements of the project, or were you just uh, uh, lifting up White Bear Lake because uh, there are uh, elected officials on the record in opposition to the project there? Uh, the White Bear Lake example. Um, uh, Madam Chair and uh, Councilmember Fredson, um, the White Bear Lake example, I chose to pick that one because uh, that is uh, most relevant to right now. In addition, it, that was the closest vote all along. So dating back to 2017, it was a 3-2 vote in favor of the project. Um, I'm not sure if it was unanimous. I suspect it may not have been unanimous in all those other communities. It's not uncommon that you might have a council member uh, that uh, chooses to uh, vote in opposition to the project, but in some communities, I suspect it was unanimous. Um, thank you. All right. Any addition, additional questions or comments? 
All right, I uh, seeing and hearing none, I'd entertain a motion to approve business item 2022-38. It's Fredson, I'll move the staff recommendation. It's moved by Fredson, is there a second? Second by Gonzalez. Seconded by Gonzalez, is there any other discussion? All right, seeing and hearing none, Jenna, could you call the roll please? Chambliss? Cummings? Aye. Fredson? Aye. Gonzalez? Aye. Sterner? Siren and Barber. Aye. With that, the motion carries. Thank you very much, Craig. Next, we're on to our inf or first we should um, um, I recommend uh, I'm thinking that the, the purple line item should go non consent to the full council and the um, one that was originally on consent can go consent as long as everyone agrees. All right, very good. Now we're on to information. Our first information item is the 2022 Transportation Committee Work Plan. And we have Wes Christian and Charles Carlson here to present. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll introduce the item and then turn it over to Wes. And then um, we can we can seek any input from the uh, committee tonight. So this is a annual report or a, a list of projects that um, really focuses on information items that may become may come before the committee across the course of the year. Uh, there's um, a, a change in this this year's approach uh, from from past reports. Uh, the work plan has typically had there's sort of one list for metro transit items and one list for MTS items. Uh, what we did this year is actually a little bit of work to try and put them together as a as a single list uh, for the committee to take a look at and then denote it in this list where something's maybe more on the Metro Transit side, where it's MTS or, or where it's both. And so um, within this, you know, I think we're, we're recognizing that there is a lot of work underway, both at Metro Transit and at MTS. Uh, far more than we could ever uh, bring before the committee in a in a reasonable amount of time. So uh, instead, we might think of this as really a, a, a longer list than we could bring, but um, potential topics that we'd curate both as they're ready across the year and uh, to the, the interests that council members might have. Um, you know, certainly uh, a number of different topic areas, both transit and outside of transit, um, these often, you know, flow into business items that may become that may come before the committee across the year, uh, but really are in this list are focusing on information items. Uh, we do seek to get some input from uh, the committee members on uh, which which topics may be a higher priority or of greater interest, and I think. Um, you know, before we bring this back as a business item next time, we'd we'd like to hear feedback from the council members on uh, which topics are are of special interest. Uh, with that, I think I'll invite Wes to uh, continue to elaborate or uh, fill in where I have uh, maybe missed anything. Need to get back online. Excuse me. Uh, Madam Chair and members, I'll, I'll mention that in the past when we've done this, uh, we've given you time with the document and we've just asked for you to send us your thoughts and ideas about what our priorities to you, as Charles mentioned. Also, if there's something missing uh, on the list, uh, to point that out, that it might be a priority to you, and then we work together to try to put together a final uh, document that represents those priorities to best we can within the time we have. I just want to also mention that there are some items that are not on here that would would go to the committee of the whole or to the full council. For example, you won't you don't see an item on here talking about green line extension because those updates are typically brought to, brought to the committee of the whole. Another example of that would be the would be the police reports, which uh, in the original charge to the police review committee, it was assumed that we'd be providing quarterly police reports to the committee of the whole or to the full council. And so we're assuming that in the in this list that that would go to the committee of the whole. Uh, the other part of that charge to the police review committee was to uh, get some instruction and direction from the council on what they'd like to see contained in those reports. Uh, so that's all part of the uh, the police review review process. And there may be others that we may not have time to provide here. We choose to bring to the committee of the whole because of the of the broad general interest by the council. I know with transit. Uh, there is there is a lot of times a broad general interest. We always make those judgments about what we bring to this committee uh, versus what we bring to the full council. So I, I we're 
in closing, we're welcoming your feedback. Uh, you can send emails to me or Charles or to both of us uh, with respect to what your priorities are and uh, what you see missing, and then we'll try to do our best to incorporate that into the final work. Okay, good. Uh, thanks, Wes and, and Charles. And because we did have a couple of council members who were not available um, this evening, I have asked Jenna to send it out and send out that same request to make sure that we get the right feedback and get a little time to sit with it and figure out um, if there are things we want to add to this. Uh, so now I have that little tidbit, I'll hand it, uh, see if there's any comments from council members. All right, they're awfully quiet, so I guess that means that everyone wants to go look at it. Uh, there, Councilmember Cummings. <laughs> oh, thank you, Madam Director, uh, uh, Madam Chair. No, I'm just wondering, it sounds like what you want is our comments as we review this in more depth um, in writing rather than right now. Is that right? Well, Madam Chair. I, I would say either, so, but yeah. I'll... I'll let Wes if he no, disagrees. Sure. I was just going to say that we we certainly uh, we can certainly record comments that you give us now, and and I was going to say the same thing, and we can do it either way. Mm -hmm. Councilmember Cummings, thank you. Uh, I'll just throw out that um, I I know we get through reports, but I I would uh, hope again that we could get um, some really thorough information about our relationship with the uh, suburban transit providers. There's been a lot of information in the, or a lot of articles, not necessarily information, but articles in the press and in the media so forth about uh, recently about things um, that have been contentious. And, and I would be interested in the impact of the coronavirus on changes to the to suburban transit providers, especially in the, the changes, red line and so forth. But if we can have a really, I think it's really important that we have a really thorough, detailed and um, complete picture of our relationship and the ongoing relationship and the challenges and the changes and so forth. So that would be my input today anyway, um, just to at a glance at, at what was in the business item. Um, Councilmember uh, Cummings, just a question um, from my perspective. Our, so we have the suburban providers coming in um, uh, Q3 to the Transportation Committee as we've done in the past. Do you want more of like a kind of a refresher of how the, the relationships work or some of those things earlier in the year? Or what are you looking for? At least at some point before uh, they come, if we can get sort of, again, a thorough overview of the relationship as it was conceived and as it has, has changed over the years, especially recently, because I have a sense that there have been more changes recently. So I'd like you know to have the Met Council perspective and then uh, a little bit closer and then um, when we get the suburban providers uh, in, input as well. So just so that we have both sides fairly close together, so that not that they're sides, but the information from both perspectives so that we can uh, have a, a thorough understanding. Sounds good. Charles, do you have any comments? No, Madam Chair, that uh, that approach sounds good to me and we can, uh, that's good feedback as we work on the final uh, work plan. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Cummings. Uh, Councilmember Fredson, anything right now? Oh, thank you. Okay, how about Councilmember Gonzalez? No, we're good, thank you. All right, sounds good. So uh, we will sit and reflect on this and we'll send you back any comments or thoughts that we have. Um, I do really like the list altogether instead of broken out into Metro Transit and MTS. I think we've done a lot of work to try and, you know, look towards common goals and be as efficient as possible. And I think this is a good example of that. So I appreciate you guys taking the time to do that. I think it makes a lot more sense and makes it uh, helps us sort of tackle it holistically. So I appreciate that. All right, then we can uh, move on to our next um, item, which we have um, the uh, Q4 2021 annual ridership report. And we have Eric Lind and John Harper here to present. Sure. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair and committee members. Uh, I am John Harper. I'm the manager of Contracted Transit Service and MTS, and I'm here with Eric Lind, who is manager of analytics and research. And uh, Chair Barber, to your point of, of bringing uh, things to the committee together, we've uh, done a, a 
you know, we've worked hard, Eric uh, and I, and the, the two groups to um, combine the MTS and the Metro Transit perspectives into these ridership reports. And uh, hopefully today we will skate through this presentation in a speedy fashion and uh, close out 2021 for you. And I will begin by talking uh, through some high level slides. Eric, as per usual in his role of analytics and research, will, will kind of hone in on an aspect uh, which we, uh, we bring to you each quarter, one aspect of the, the ridership to, to, to hone in on. So uh, I will uh, start the presentation here if we go to the next slide. This chart shows 2020 and 2021 ridership. And as you can see, uh, COVID impacted transit service almost exactly two years ago. Uh, at the end of March of 2020, we cut service dramatically. Ridership went down dramatically due to the impacts of COVID on our transit service. This presentation, uh, the first part here will break up into a couple pieces. Uh, one will just kind of show you where we're at. Uh, and then one slide will try to remove the noise of that first quarter of 2020 to show you how we are compared to COVID last year instead of just annual to annual. So let's move on to the next slide. This slide, as usual, shows you the modes and types of service that make up our ridership. And uh, I'll just point out here, as we all know, the commuter and, express, commuter and express ridership is a much smaller portion of our work in 2021 than it was in 2020. Uh, for the reason I just mentioned that to me is the kind of the biggest note uh, to mention here. So this, uh, you know, like I said, shows the modes and types of service with local bus being our uh, workhorse and light rail being a significant portion of our service and our ridership. So let's move on. This uh, compares totals 2020 to 2021 for the council ridership as a whole. And um, you can see the numbers here. Uh, you know, the one point that I will uh, break out for you specifically, you see that Metro Mobility ridership is actually up this year from 2020. Uh, that is uh, primarily due to the reduction, the significant reduction that Metro Mobility service had in quarter two in particular of 2020 when the uh, when COVID struck, the Metro Mobility ridership went down, uh, almost down to zero, and we've been working our way back. And we are now at approximately 75% of pre-COVID ridership on Metro Mobility. Uh, and Eric will get into that a little bit later. Uh, but that's that's one place where we have seen the ridership really come back. Uh, you know, and in other places here, we are recovering. So let's move to the next slide. Uh, this slide removes the pre-COVID portion of 2020 from the comparison. So it's Q2 through Q4 of 2020 to 2021. And you'll see in all cases, we are up from the, the beginnings of COVID. So ridership dropped, uh, as I mentioned, uh, at the end of the very first quarter of 2020. And we have been gradually working our way out of that ridership uh, whole, so to speak. Uh, some services are up uh, much more than others, but uh, you can see the numbers here in all of the modes and all of the types of service operated uh, at the council, we are seeing ridership rebound from the, the heart of the COVID uh, pandemic. So next slide, please. This slide breaks down the bus service into its bus type components. Um, and this, once again, is back to the year as a whole. So this includes the first quarter of 2020. And uh, as I mentioned in the, in, the, uh, in the stacked chart earlier, express ridership is, is really where we've taken the biggest hit uh, in our ridership uh, in this region. And that's you know, true across all the different providers uh, in the region and really nationally as express ridership is where the where the brunt of the ridership decreases have taken place. And we certainly have felt that here. So next slide, please. 
This slide brings in the other regional providers and talking about express service on the previous slide, the uh, service reductions that you see uh, on this slide really are indicative of that express service drop. We have really uh, across the board at uh, the various agencies, including us and uh, the uh, suburban providers as well, the express ridership uh, went down um, precipitously with the start of COVID and the reductions that you see here are really an indicator of that reduction in express ridership. Some providers are have more heavily expressed. Maple Grove, for example, uh, is primarily an express provider. And so their reduction is down 54% uh, uh, as opposed to MAP, uh, MVTA, which has a uh, local service. And so their ridership wasn't hit quite as hard. There are uh, dial -a ride services in most of these service areas as well. And those rides uh, are incorporated into the uh, numbers here too. And I think we have seen um, the dial -a ride numbers increase uh, somewhat uh, as uh, a rebound from the, the depths of the COVID reduction. And uh, the U of M ridership uh, I believe this this uh, number for the U of M is fiscal year 2020 to fiscal year 2021. And so I will comment that the U of M ridership in the last uh, few months of this year uh, increased. Uh, now that the students are returning, have returned to campus, that number has gone up uh, significantly on the U service. But uh, while the U was distance learning the ridership was down significantly. Uh, so uh, next slide, please. So at this point, I'll turn the presentation over to Eric to kind of drill down a little bit into the numbers that I just presented at a high level and provide some uh, key takeaways, and then we'll take some questions. So Eric, thank you. Thanks, uh, Madam Chair and Council Members. So. As John was sort of mentioning, it's very difficult to look at uh, years as coherent units uh, during COVID. Of course, time has got very strange meaning during COVID in general, but when you're talking about year over year comparisons, you have to be careful. So the next few things I wanted to concentrate on just show what happened over 2021 as a year from beginning to end. And this can help us understand a little bit of what was happening. So first looking at all of the different council services, uh, what this graph is showing is the percent of uh, pre-COVID. So think, uh, you know, what would it have been in 2020, uh, you know, had it not had COVID not happened, and comparing what we observed throughout 2021. So, for instance, that top dotted line represents Metro Mobility, and you can see a very steady um, around 70 to 80 percent across the year. So that means the, that uh, Metro Mobility ridership was down 20 to 30 percent, pretty continuous across the year 2021. So if we move down to the, the next one, the darker line, um, darker blue, which represents BRT, and like uh, the light, the green light rail line and the red dash the regular bus line in the fixed route world. Um, those all showed sort of steady increases with their highest ridership in the fall. Uh, the BRT was the most robust type of fixed route service with um, it you know, peaking out at about 70% of pre-COVID ridership. Um, but overall was definitely uh, more resilient. And again, we saw that in John's earlier chart with it being down only 1% year over year. Uh, Transit Link, uh, in the light blue dashed one uh, line, sorry, was around 50 to 60% of its pre-COVID ridership. And then North Star there in the gray, uh, being essentially a dedicated office commute line and event support line uh, had much stronger impacts of, of the loss of those commutes, of the rise of telework and so on. And so it, it was uh, in its best months around 15% um, in October of what it would have been uh, pre-COVID. Next slide, please. So to go any, even further, 
what I wanted to do was actually look at all the weekdays of the year, which is what's represented here. So each dot or square is uh, a single day and the ridership is over there uh, of that day on Metro Transit service. And the colors represent uh, the type. So we've lumped all the regular commuter express bus, um, local bus, suburban local bus into orange colored dots. The two light rail lines are grouped together in green squares. The BRT lines are red triangles and the North Star are those blue pluses. And so this just gives you an, an idea of the scale of the different um, modes. So as uh, John mentioned before, bus is the sort of highest ridership mode followed by light rail. So it's kind of split. If you add BRT and regular bus together, it's about two thirds or a little more light rail, about a third. So I'm going to walk through three different slices of the year to kind of um, tell a story about what our ridership looked like during during the past uh, 12 months. So next slide, please. So the first the first slice is what I would call COVID era normal. Um, it's hard to remember back to a year ago, um, but early 2021 vaccination was not widespread. Uh, the pandemic was still in a very uncertain place. We hadn't gotten to um, you know, a, a firm idea of when, um, for instance, people would be gathering in big groups again and that sort of thing. So um, that uncertainty through the year kind of um, did go down as vaccinations became more widespread. And we did start to see more use of the transit network. You can see a sort of a slight increase looking at those orange dots on the bus network, you know, from 50,000 to over 60,000 rides a day. So not, not approaching pre-pandemic, but definitely increasing in this kind of COVID era normal. So this is a very strong base of our ridership. Uh, and if you remember prior conversations in this group, we talked about how there, there weren't uh, sort of two peaks in the day. It was kind of a single peak late in the afternoon, uh, the different types of travel that were happening. So next slide, please. So we came to the fall. And as you can sort of look at this chart, there was a noticeable change in level of ridership. And so this, this burst of ridership corresponded with um, a great deal of activity, um, not so much in office commutes, but especially in school commutes. So John just mentioned the University of Minnesota, went back to full in-person learning. Other colleges in the Twin Cities did as well. The high schools in Minneapolis and St. Paul, uh, of course, use Metro Transit service for their students. And in 2021, St. Paul actually um, reached out to Metro Transit to try to expand its high school pass program because, again, with the theme of the day, uh, St. Paul was having trouble finding operators for their school bus network. So they used Metro Transit to kind of augment um, travel for their students. And we saw that in the ridership. Um, there was a lot more consistent commuting, and there were starting to be peaks in the day and it would be about 7 a.m. But it would then the afternoon peak would be about 3 p.m., which is uh, correspondent with a lot of student travel activity and not so much office commute. So that just continuing that story that that is um, a missing trip type on our system, even through late 2021. Next slide. Okay, then we came to the end of the year, uh, which I was kind of terming things fall apart a bit, but uh, this is when Omicron arrived. We had a coincidence of, you know, the direct impact of that COVID um, explosion, basically taking a lot of our drivers off the street because they were either uh, um, sick themselves or caring for loved ones. We had the sort of indirect effects of lots less travel happening because in general people were staying home uh, or had um, did not have the places to go that they did before. And of course, we have usually a decline in seasonal demand around the time of the holidays, but this was this was a much uh, stronger decline, uh, which we can lar largely chalk up to uh, COVID. So next slide, please. So so overall, uh, what we're seeing is you know across the year, and looking at those Q2 to Q4 comparisons, I think we can see that we saw increased demand last year, even during COVID. We really got bolstered by return to regular travel patterns in the student community. 
And we hope to see that continuing both with high school and university college ridership uh, this spring. Just to reemphasize what we've said before uh, to this committee, which is that you know the high frequency network, the metro network, all day, all purpose trips is still the strongest part of our network. That's where we saw the, the least declines. And again, it provides us a really solid base moving forward uh, to, to build upon. Next slide. So uh, challenges, COVID-19 is, is the challenge. <laughs> If we can solve that um, socially, you know, and and become more predictable in the travel that people are making, we can do a better job of providing the opportunities for people to travel on our network. So we really want um, that to happen, as does everyone else. Uh, the theme of operator availability uh, that Wes referred to earlier is very important. Um, we can't provide the service that we want to, unless we have the full complement of operators. Um, and when we don't have the full complement, we end up with things like reduced schedules, which we've done, and having trip cuts, um, you know, kind of ad hoc trip cuts at the moment rather than plans service reductions. And both of those are, are bad for ridership in ways that I'm sure you can imagine. Um, finally, we're you know, gonna continue to try to understand what the new travel patterns are going to be. Uh, we have, uh, of course, partnered again with MTS um, and, and their travel behavior research people to uh, hopefully implement um, the TBI onboard survey sometime soon. We have some pilot data that we're just looking at in terms of how people are using the system. Um, so we can't necessarily forecast when things are gonna go back to um, what they were before, if they ever do, um, but we can keep um, using all these different data sources we have available to understand what the current travel market is and try to meet that with our service. So I think that is the last slide and John and I will stand for questions. Very good, thank you, John and Eric. All right, um, questions from council members. I'm not seeing anything, just a quick comment. I do like the way that you guys have pull together the way you're presenting this information. I think it really does tell a good story. I'm really curious to see what happens in the second half of 2022. Um, I think it might take that long for things to quiet down, um, assuming we don't get another new surprise with COVID-19, but I'm very curious to see. But I think you've created a framework that we have good metrics to measure against. And um, thank you also for putting the data together with the quarters two through four, um, so that we're getting a chance to really look a little more at apples to apples. Um, I think that's really helpful um, because as we're trying to figure out how fast to bring back and expand service, I think it's that we have to keep that context of not just you know wanting to bring ridership back to 2019 levels, but also knowing that no matter what we do, travel behavior is going to change, and and as a result of sort of the cultural changes we've had the last couple of years, um, so I really appreciate the way you guys have done this. So, all right, um, and one last call, call out to my fellow council member Fredson. Yeah, I, I would just second that, and I mean you're seeing announcements come from employers in downtown Minneapolis, you know, about bringing people back downtown, and um governors across the country talking about moving from pandemic to endemic stages and i just think that generally there's a desire to to get back to more normal and with that hopefully we'll see some uh rebound uh in ridership so thank you and thank you okay right. anything else from other council members all right well thank you very much john and eric very, very well done um and that actually you, concludes your business for this evening so you're going to have something that we don't very often have, have, which is a short transportation committee meeting. So I wish it was warmer and you could go outside, but we're getting there. Spring will come before we know it, right? So, all right, with that, we can be adjourned. All right. Thank you. Have a good evening. Bye-bye.